I've spread this water out. It's now in contact with a lot of land surface, isn't it? That means the velocity is going to really slow down. Even though I've increased the cross-sectional area some, I've really cut down on the velocity. Discharge is going down despite the fact that, that it's starting to raise. Or the water level is starting to raise. So I've got less energy to move this material. And that means that as the water moves out of the channel into the floodplain, that energy level is going to drop right there. And it's going to drop out the coarse grain material, the sands, the gravels, that kind of stuff. And it's just going to accumulate right there at the bank. Right at the edge. As that water flows out across the floodplain, all the coarse materials dropped out right along the levee area along the bank, and now it's just the muds, clays and the silts in the water. And as that water spreads out and the flood recedes, now I've got a problem because not all the water can get back to the channel. I've built up this levee along the side, so now this levee's this much higher along the side. All the water that went across the floodplain can't get back, only the water to the top of that levee. So all that other water behind the levee is now trapped out on the floodplain. And it's going to have to either evaporate or it's going to have to simply infiltrate into the groundwater. In some cases, it does that readily and it's good farmland. In other cases, not so much. And it just stays swampy and wet all the time. The next flood comes along before it can dry out, and it just becomes what we call a back swamp area. Swamp, because that's what it is, it is in back of the levees in this area away from the channel. And what am I going to get for sediments there? I've just got silts and clays left in the, in the water. And as that now becomes just a swampy area, it's quiet. And now those silts and clays can settle out. And the floodplain uh, is covered with that material. All the natural levee was built with the sands and gravels when they first dropped out. So we get a real different way of looking at the floodplain. It's not just a big, flat place. And you can see here, as the channels moved and cut back and forth, you can see the old channels, and you can see the natural levees, and you can see the old back swamp areas. And notice how you can kind of pick it out just by looking at the vegetation. Because different plant material grows in silts and clays than in sands and gravels. So even though this meander bend has long since gone from the area, you can still pick it out because you can kind of make out the difference in the vegetation along the natural levee and the clay that eventually filled in the channel. So it's kind of cool. You can pick these systems apart. <coughs> so once we're out onto the floodplain, what we're seeing is the channel has established its grade. And what it's doing now is not down cutting. That was what it did back up in the headland. And it's still doing that as it erodes headland into the, into the mountain system. <coughs> but now it's starting to just cut sideways and create this big floodplain. And as the stream matures and it has less water to transport, it doesn't need all that floodplain. So what it'll do is it'll cut a new floodplain down a little lower, but a lot narrower. So you end up with a series of floodplains kind of incised one into the other, uh, all done mostly by this uh, slight bit of down cutting to maintain its grade. But for the most part, now we're looking at sideways cut, lateral cut. So you've noticed these big bends that the Mississippi takes, right? We just looked at a picture of them. And how do you think they work? They're kind of kind of interesting. If you think in terms of our U-shaped valley, remember we said 
that the fastest velocity would be right here at the top in the middle because it was the furthest away from the sides of the channel. So here it is, it's just chugging along. And now it's got to go around this bend. Well, what's going to make that high velocity part of the stream want to turn? Nothing. It wants to keep going straight. It doesn't want to change. So the net effect is this high maximum velocity thread is simply going to keep going until it hits the bank on the other side of the bend, on the outside bend. That's going to make it bend, finally. So what we're seeing is this maximum velocity now is shifting from the center of the channel to the outer bend of the channel. Uh, higher velocity can handle more sediment. So my major erosion point, my major point of carrying material now, just shifted from the center of the channel to the outside bend. And now this outside bend is going to see the maximum erosion possible by this channel. And this outside bend is what we call the cut bank, because the stream is cutting into it removing material and carrying it away. Well, notice how as it comes over the bend, it kind of shoots it back to the middle of the stream. And then the same thing repeats. Nothing turns it, so it hits the cut bank on the next bend. But notice the cut bank on the next turn is the other side of the stream. So it's shifting. Out, out, out. It's always going to just one after the other flip flop as it goes down the stream. Now, at the same time, look what's happening on the opposite side of the stream. The cut bank being chewed up, maximum velocity. Man, things are rushing by there, heavy erosion. And yet, on the inside of the stream, I'm getting deposition. Wait a minute. How come? How can I have deposition on one side of the stream and massive erosion on the other side of the stream? Well, this is why they put differentials in cars. Try and get around a bend. And if you had two wheels on the same axis, as you went around the bend, you've got two different radiuses to deal with, don't you? You've got the radius on the inside of the bend, and you've got the radius on the outside of the bend, a lot further distance. And how are you going to do that if the wheels are fixed to each other? They're going to be hopping and skipping and skidding along because they need to be traveling at different speeds to make that bend. Same thing's happening here. Your maximum velocity in the stream just shifted to be the outside of the radius, didn't it? On the inside, though, it's just got a little radius to get around. It can really slow up. And that's what it does. So the inside bend on the stream is slowing up. The water on the outside of the bend is speeding up even more because all this water has got to get around that bend all together. So I've got maximum erosion on the outside of the bend because that's where the water is speeding up. And I've actually got things slowing up so much on the inside of the bend that the water is going, I can't carry all this stuff anymore. I don't have any energy left. I had to slow up, and it's all going to start dropping out of suspension. So what I see on the inside here is I'm going to start to develop what's called a point bar. And this is going to deposit. And as the cut bank eats away on the outside, the point fire is going to deposit and grow on the inside. So the net effect is this bend is going to be kind of moving outward and downstream. Same with this one, outward and downstream, outward and downstream. So these point bar cut bank systems are all going to kind of end up migrating downstream essentially. Very dynamic area. Okay, so point fires will migrate upstream, is that true? Okay. 
63, I think we got everybody. Huh? Okay. So now we just think he did. I just told you this is a guy. So happy you were asleep. Phone fires and cut banks are working together, right? They're just on opposite sides of the street. Cut banks eating away, point fires growing up. But the both of them are kind of a pair. They go together, and they're going to be moving this way, this way, the next one's going to go that way, the next one's going to go that way. And the net effect is they're going sideways, but they're also going downstream. Okay, so point fires. And cut banks migrate downstream. That's obviously a little bit of a, a simplification, but that, that's the net effect. Let me show you an example here. Here we, we've got this meandering system here. It's flowing from top to bottom. And notice, here's the cut bank here. Here's a cut bank. There's a cut bank. There's a cut bank. Okay, every place you're on the outside of the bend, there's a cut bank, and it's eroding. So it's eroding there, and it's eroding there. This neck is getting eaten away from two sides. And as those cut banks finally merge, cut through the neck, we've got a neck now that has shortened the, the river. And this whole meander now has been cut off. And sediment is being dumped into the, the side bank of the new river, isolating this old meander bed. And you can see that here. Look at the new river here. Look at the old meander bend here that's since been cut off. And you can see how the river has naturally sealed off this opening. And this isn't the first. You can see some old scars here, what we call meander scars, that shows how this meander grew out to its present location. And you can see all of these meander scars all through this floodplain area here in this picture. So what we've ended up with is we've formed a kind of a separate lake. It used to be part of the river, but now it's a cutoff lake. And we call these oxbow lakes. And the reason it's an oxbow lake is um, the oxen had these bows that uh, they, you know, they had these big, huge beams that they'd have on their shoulders, a kind of a bow that went down around their neck to hold it in place. And that's what this looked like. It, this is what the settlers kind of thought it reminded them of. So that's how these things got their name. But oxbow or cut off lakes uh, are just old meanders. So, Cutoffs will shorten the river's overall length and increase its gradient. Ships can just come right through there. They don't have to make the distance all the way around the meander bank. So yeah, I've shortened the river's distance. And I still am at the same elevation here and here, but now the river's taking a much shorter distance between that elevation change. That means the gradient's going to be steeper through there, right? <coughs> Rise over run. Sure. Oh. <coughs> so, so we've just shortened up the run. The rise is still the same. That means you're going to have a steeper gradient. So what's the river going to do in response? Eat up. It's going to eat it up. It's going to regrade itself, isn't it? So there's going to be a lot of erosion going on there. And that's where a lot of that sediment then comes from. So it can fill in <coughs> the old channel the old uh, meander and isolate it as an oxbow lake.
Okay, so through this process, over time, what we're going to see is the floodplain is going to become a smaller floodplain, kind of eaten into the old floodplain, and that process might repeat. And what we end up seeing left then are the remnants of these old floodplains along the edges of the valley system. And these are what we call stream terraces. So uh, oftentimes uh, you'll be in an area where there'll be multiple terraces. In other places, not so many. It just depends on how the stream is adjusting to the load that it's carrying today. But this gives me a way of kind of looking at this part of the stream and getting a sense of how old it is. What stage is it at in its development? And you can see that as it goes from these narrow V-shaped valleys, they start to downcut, eventually cut laterally to open up and build a floodplain. And as the floodplain then starts to show up with terraces, multiple terraces, I've kind of stepped through the development process. So I kind of know in a relative sense uh, what the age of this river transport segment is. Eventually, I'm going to get to really old age. And here you can see I've got a meander bend right through here. Notice how it's cut down through all of the strata. You can see flatline strata. Got a little bit left here in the center of the bend. It's going to be isolated now as a couple of these necks eat their way through. And you can see here, this is the last remnants of a river system. This used to be the floodplain up here. It's almost all just channel now. And this is just a little bit of a remnant of one of these point bars before it finally got eroded. So when you go up to Arches National Park, those arches basically are telling you that's an old fluvial or an old river system at its very, very final stages. Fluvial is, is uh, what we call this river system type of geology. So how are these stream systems moving all this material? Well, they do it in a number of ways. One, they can just roll it along on the bottom of the bed, and the heavier big stuff is going to be too big to pick, be picked up. But it can get kind of pushed along. Um, then as the energy level increases, we start to be able to pick up some of that material. Just borderline, just barely pick it up. So what we see happen is the piece gets picked up into suspension, but there just isn't enough energy to keep it all stirred up and keep it up there, and it falls back to the bottom. But in the process, it's been carrying down the stream a little bit. And little by little, the various pieces get picked up, carried downstream, fall back to the bottom, and the process repeats. This is a process that we call saltation. Now, let's raise the energy level just a little bit more. Now I've got enough energy in the water system to keep things in suspension, keep it stirred up. Bigger pieces are going to be able to go into saltation. Even bigger pieces will be able to roll along the bottom. But now I'm able to pick up the smallest stuff. It basically stays suspended in the water column, stirred in, mixed in, and carried along that way. This is when you start to see the water turn brown, right? Everything's stirred into the water. Another thing that we see happen is water tends to be slightly acidic. Natural rainwater tends to be just a little acidic. I put a little acidic water over this material that tends to be a little basic, and rather than pick it up in chunks, what I start to do is slowly dissolve it. I chemically weather it, breaking ions apart. <coughs> so I've got a load that's part of this suspended load, but it's dissolved load. I don't even see.